Wonderful Amy, how can you blame me for loving you? Since you've won the praise of every nation, you have filled my heart with admiration. Amy, wonderful Amy, I'm proud of the way you flew. Believe me, Amy, you cannot blame me, Amy, for falling in love with you. Aviatrix Amy Johnson, the fearless and flamboyant figure of Margaret Fontaine, one of the leading lepidopterists of the Victorian era, whose diaries became a publishing sensation, the pioneering ophthalmologist Dame Ida Mann, the first woman to hold a chair at Oxford, more recently the novelist and Nobel laureate Doris Lessing. From its earliest days, West Hampstead has been home to many remarkable women who've broken new ground and shaped the history of ideas. Georgina Solomon lived in Sumatra Road and was married to the man known as the Gladstone of South Africa, who fought for racial and religious equality. She was a militant suffragette, and took part in a window-smashing campaign for which she served time in Holloway Prison. In 1911, she addressed an important letter to the editor of The Times, describing her own and other suffragettes' brutal treatment at the hands of police, whom they believed to be acting under the orders of the then Home Secretary, Winston Churchill. Rosa May Billinghurst, who was sentenced to eight months in prison for damaging letterboxes, and who famously went on hunger strike and was force-fed, addressed her first public meeting after her release in West Hampstead in March 1913, a meeting broken up by the distribution of sulfurated hydrogen and snuff. Bedded in the cemetery at Fortune Green is the wife of Sir Arthur Blomfield, the architect who designed St James's Church which now doubles as the area's main post office and is equipped with tea shop and children's playground. And the West Hampstead Studios, also in Sheriff Road, which have housed an extraordinary eclectic and distinguished stream of artists over the years. Lady Sarah Louisa Blomfield was a supporter of the suffragettes and protector of the rights of women, children and prisoners and animals, a defender of the oppressed, and an ardent promoter of peace and international religious understanding. A favourite haunt of the suffragettes was the Eustace Miles restaurant near Charing Cross Station, which hosted celebratory breakfasts for the suffragette prisoners released from Holloway. Eustace Miles was born at West End House, West Hampstead, and had been a silver medalist in real tennis at the 1908 London Olympics, he was also an avid exponent of physical culture, a prolific writer on all manner of subjects. His books included a comparative syntax of Greek and Latin, and an advocate of vegetarianism, or fleshless food. So famous was his faddish and feminist-friendly restaurant that it was parodied in E.M. Foster's Howard's End. It's all proteins and bodybuildings, and people come up to you and beg your pardon, but you have such a beautiful aura. Ellen Terry's daughter, Edith Craig, had a pitch outside the restaurant from which she used to sell the Votes for Women newspaper. The man responsible for several of West Hampstead's great mansion blocks, Edward Jarvis Cave of Chislet Road, now Compain Gardens, had a daughter who blazed a trail in ice. Madge Sires became the first woman ever to enter the figure skating world championships when she discovered, in 1902, that the competition did not specify the sex of the participants. She finished second, a feat that induced the officials to ban female competitors. In 1908, she won the first Olympic gold medal awarded in women's figure skating. Another trailblazing woman of sport was Martina Bergman Hosterberg, who at her home in Broadhurst Gardens founded the Hampstead Physical Training College and Gymnasium for Women, the first physical training college in England. 
She introduced P.E. into the school curriculum and introduced to her students in West Hampstead the game from which modern netball evolved. She was a significant advocate for women's suffrage and emancipation and is credited with inventing the gym slip as female athletic wear, releasing women from the constraints of the corset. Deeds, not words, may have been the suffragette's motto, but words were important too. Margaret Shermer Sibthorpe lived and worked in West Bear Road in the 1890s and early 1900s and was the founder and sole editor of the women's penny paper, Shafts. The masthead declared, A paper for women and the working classes, making it the first women's advocacy periodical explicitly to address readers outside the middle class. Sibthorpe described shafts as the outgoing of my vital breath, the result of the anxious yearning of my inmost spirit, the manifestation of my deep desire to serve the cause of women. Like other women throughout the country, West Hampstead women contributed to vital war work, and several of its female artists documented such work and other aspects of war on the home front and abroad. Anna Airy, granddaughter of the astronomer royal who established Greenwich as the location of the prime meridian, occupied one of the Sheriff Road studios built by Blomfield and was one of the first women officially commissioned as a war artist, turning her skills from exquisite botanical studies and still life to documentary depictions of munition factories. One Nelly Isaac of Dennington Park Road, West Hampstead, did this drawing showing rows of female munitions workers watching a theatre performance in 1914. Another resident of NW6, Reginald Edward Higgins, a designer of striking deco railway posters, did illustrations for The Bystander and The Tattler that depict, almost without exception, women of stylish independence and his contributions during the First World War are dominated by women's roles, from drivers to Whitehall clerks. He was a prime exponent of the modern girl, reinventing the blue stocking for the Charleston era and making her a force to be reckoned with.